And today, in regards to meaningful connections, I want to put a little bit of focus, maybe I should say a whole lot of focus, on establishing a meaningful connection with God, really taking your relationship with God to that next level in regards to meaningfulness, and then how that can impact and directly affect every other relationship that's in your life. And in order to do that, I need to speak within a specific vein today. And uh, it was during our worship night that uh, actually Jaron was uh, sharing some thoughts and uh, I think he shared something that wasn't even necessarily scripted or maybe not even a part of his notes. He just spoke about how that he felt like that God wanted to establish a stillness in the hearts of many people that evening. And the moment he said that, things just began to resonate in me and I actually zoned out for a minute and just went straight into the word and God really started speaking some stuff to me on that subject. And so I'd like to thank you for the, uh, the seed to the sower and the uh, giving me the, the thought to, to chase this down today. So I want to I drop an anchor with two verses. Mark chapter 4, verse number 39, it says this, And then Jesus arose, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. Familiar passage, famous words of Jesus. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And then Jesus turns and begins to rebuke the disciples because of their fearfulness and their lack of faith. I'd like to show you another verse. It's in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish you for you today. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. It's an extremely deep passage of text. There are, is unbelievable th theological exegesis available within this verse. And today, I in no ways will attempt to unpack all of that. I really just want to take it and share with you some things in this regard. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Would you just look over at somebody and tell them, be still. Be still. Still means unmoving, soundless, serene quiet, calm, be still. The opposite of stillness is restlessness or disturbance. God said, be still, stand still. Let's talk about a meaningful connection with God today in that vein. Father, help me to preach, help me to teach, help me to share your word. Lord, let your will be done in Jesus' name. And this church said, amen. amen. Mandy and I are blessed with two kids. Most of you know that. Um, we have a 16-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old son. And they're very different. Uh, they have very different personalities. But our son, when he was first born, uh, up until he was about seven months old, the kid was so peaceful. He was so calm. He was so still. And one evening, uh, we had a friend of ours that was preaching for us. It was actually during a Sunday evening gathering, and uh, this gentleman happened to be like a mentor in our lives, and he stopped in the middle of his sermon, and Mandy was holding Dawson. He looked over there, and he said, that kid is going to be full of fire. He's going to be so full of fire, he's going to have a hard time sitting still. And I remember thinking, like, I love this guy, and I know he probably hears the voice of the Lord, but I think he's really off base with this. It was like it woke something up in Dawson. About a year later, we could not remember the last time he had slept an entire night. We couldn't remember the last time that he hadn't been fidgeting or moving around. And I can tell you that even when he was about five years old, I actually have a picture where, that really captures my son's personality. Um, this is when he's four or five years old, and I, I was traveling to preach somewhere, and I had been assigned babysitting duty, and we had went into what looks like a Starbucks, and I had like, tried to find like, some time just to, to be quiet to be still, to make sure I had the right message, to try to hear the Lord, to, to go over the message, to be prayerful about the message. And every time I would look up, Dawson was rolling around in that chair, standing up on top of that chair, getting ready to flip off backwards and hurt himself. And I, I remember just repetitively, be still! 
It didn't work then. It don't work now. At 14 years old, he still is moving constantly. He, his mind is always racing, and if his body's not moving, he's got to be moving his hands. He's got to be watching something, doing something. He's, he's just, he just struggles to be still. He's extremely fidgety. He gets it from his mother. <laughs> Maybe you've raised some kids, and you've noticed that sometimes it's hard to get them to be still. You know, it's really not just an issue with babies or toddlers or children or teenagers. I think all of us in one way or another struggle with being still. And that's why when we read a verse like this, Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still. I mean, when you're afraid, the last thing you want to do is stand still. When you're wrestling with fear, when you're wrestling with concern, when you're going through some kind of struggle, you, you don't want to stand still. But one of the things that God is communicating here is that one of the displays that they are not struggling with fear is that they are going to be able to stand still. But if you're not careful, you can actually get a little bit confused in reading this verse in context. Because right here, verse 13 and 14, God is telling them, Stand still. The very next verse, verse number 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Is anybody else confused? Because I thought you just told me to stand still. And now you're going to tell me to go forward? Well, wait a second, God. Which one is it that you want from me? Do you want me to stand still or do you want me to go forward? And the truth of it is, a lot of us, if we would be honest, we are in that place of tension in our own walk with God. We're not really for sure if we should stand still or if we should go forward. I want to talk to you today about how to discern that. Because one of the things that the Lord goes right on to say in this same package, passage is that he is getting ready to fight for the people of Israel, the Hebrew people. But, but the time in which that God says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, he doesn't just say this in Exodus 14. He also says it in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verse 17, he says it this way. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. You won't have to fear. You won't have to be dismayed because tomorrow you're going to discover that the Lord is with you. So now when you take Exodus 14 and 2 Chronicles and you put them together, you begin to, to see it with a little more clarity. That, that there is going to be a time to stand still and there's going to be a time to go forward. Because what happens when you are obedient to God in the moment that you are required and expected to go forward, it will position you for the moment when you get to stand still. And the reason that you're going to get to stand still is because God doesn't intend for you to be the one who does the fighting. It says he's about to show up in both scenarios and do the fighting for you. And so it's really important to walk out the things that God tells you to walk out, specifically the things that his scripture instructs you to do, even if it is against your own understanding. Because when you go forward in relation to God's command, it puts you in a position where you get to literally stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So I want you to look over somebody and just tell them, be still, be still. How do you know when it's time to be still. How do you know when you've went forward far enough? How do you know when you've reached the point where it is acceptable to say, okay, now I'm going to watch God do this thing? Well, I think one of the ways that it becomes obvious that it's time to stand still is when you are able to evaluate your life and determine why you are still moving forward. Are you still moving forward because you, you understand what we're talking about is we're not talking anything negative about vision. We're not talking about anything about forward progression in your life. We're talking about there's going to be some specific moments of stillness in your life. Make sense? 
And so how, how do you know when you've reached that place, when you have done the things that now it, God is saying, okay, it, it, you, you're going to take a moment and you're just going to be still. How do you know you're there? I think it's when we're able to evaluate why am I still moving forward? Am I doing it because it is a clear instruction from God or am I doing it because I'm running from something? And I think that there are a lot of people that just move in life without a lot of intentionality, without a lot of systematic approach, without a lot of clarity, but for no other reason than the fact there's something chasing them and they don't want to get caught. And the way that the Hebrew people knew that it was time to stand still is in Exodus chapter 14, he tells them, go forward. And the reason they go forward is because they've been released from Egyptian bondage. And now they find themselves, literally, if you look at the geography, there's a mountain on each side of them and there's a Red Sea in front of them. But God parted the Red Sea. Somebody remember the story? And they walk across on dry ground. And once they get to the other side, the enemy is still chasing them. The enemy is still moving in their direction. But once that enemy got into the middle of that parted Red Sea, the Bible explicitly says that God caused the wheels to come off the enemy's chariots. And that thing that was chasing them couldn't chase them any longer. And there was nothing coming at them in the rearview mirror any longer longer. Now they got the opportunity to literally just stand still. And God said, you're going to see my salvation. In other words, watch this. And so I think some of us, we, we, we never really acknowledge the fact that the thing that was chasing us isn't chasing us any longer. Our God has a way of making old things pass away and everything become new again. We become a new creature in Christ Jesus. We become born again in Christ Jesus. And the result of that is things that used to have a hold on us and used to have authority on us, God takes the wheels off of it. Now, I don't believe in running if there ain't nothing chasing you. That's why I don't exercise. My son and I, we were down in Bowling Green and we had dropped Mandy and Natalie off for something and I could have done what a normal human being would do. I could have sat in the parking lot and waited on them to come out. But my son does get it honest. I just can't sit still. And so I decided I'd get out and explore and move around. I got myself so lost that it took me 35 minutes to get back to where Mandy was at. I even had Google and Siri confused because <laughs> I couldn't sit still. And in the process of trying to get back to wherever it was I had dropped them off, I started making laps evidently around the same block and I started noticing with every lap I was making in the vehicle, there was this guy and he was running along the sidewalk. And I looked at Dawson and I said, that dude, he's just running around and around and around and around. And finally I decided to help him. So I just rolled down the window and I said, sir, there ain't nobody chasing you. He didn't think it was funny either. <laughs> but if there isn't anything chasing you, why is it that we run so scared? And we run from this thing to that thing and from this appointment to that appointment and this manufactured busyness to that manufactured business. Am I making sense to anybody? And we just, we're constantly in movement. And I think it's because we're so uncomfortable with stillness. There's this thing called FOMO, the fear of missing out. And, and the, the truth of it is probably every single one of us wrestle with it in some way. That's why we stay constantly connected. We get in a car. We turn on noise. We go in the house, we turn on noise. We are addicted to noise. And maybe I'm not talking to everybody, but I'm talking to more than just somebody. Because even now when we go into a restaurant, there, there's not just one screen. There are screens all the way around. To the point that even when we're having a meal, breaking bread together, it's very difficult to have a meaningful connection because there's so much hindrance, there's so much distraction. 
Go in a restaurant sometime and just watch how families will come in, sometimes even couples on a date night, and they will look down and they will never have a meaningful connection with one another because they constantly just scroll and flip through the noise. And in the same way that that kind of stuff is affecting our meaningful connection with one another, I believe that it is affecting our meaningful connection with God because we don't know how to be still. And sometimes we never really get to see the incredible things that he is doing in our life because we are so uncomfortable with being still. And so sometimes we're out here fighting our own battle and doing stuff that even God would never have expected of us because we don't know how to be still and just let God be God. So I want you to look at somebody and tell them, be still. So many hindrances in our life that keep us from being still. I was a young guy. I was getting started in ministry. There was an African bishop. We were helping his churches in that continent. He came to see us. He spent the night with us. The next morning, he was having breakfast with us. And, and as he went, and, he, and we're sitting at a little counter there in our kitchen, he looks at me and he says, young man, you need to understand something. You're a young guy. You need to get this straight. He said, the enemy's going to come at you, and he's going to try to get you to fail with sexual immorality. I'm going to try to get you to make a mistake that will damage your ministry and distance you from the presence of God. And if he can't get you to fail in that regard, he'll come at you and he'll try to get you to do something crazy with money. Try to get you to misappropriate funds or steal something or take something that doesn't belong to you so that he can distance you from God. And he said if he can't get you to get in bed with somebody that's not your wife or take money that doesn't belong to you, he'll try to offend you. He'll try to make you bitter. He'll try to get you to the point where your heart's calloused and you walk around feeling entitled because of some bitterness that you've allowed to be nurtured in your life. He said, and if that doesn't work, then the enemy will bring out the spirit of hindrance and he will attack you with distraction and hindrance on all four sides of your life. And you will find yourself literally struggling sometimes just to keep it all straight because of all the noise that the enemy will surround you with. He said, because if the enemy can't attack you in this way, he's going to try the next way. And if the next way doesn't work, he's going to... And I can tell you over and over again in my life, my wife and I, we talk openly about this, that it just seems like the enemy is so insistent and so intent on keeping people distracted and even us ourselves wrestling with hindrances that, that, that make you feel like you've got to constantly be moving, you've got to constantly be doing something, and you wrestle with the anxiety of, what are you missing out on if you're not moving right now? We're uncomfortable with stillness. Stillness is awkward. Stillness feels weird. Whoever was listening on the radio broadcast has already flipped the channel because they thought something was wrong. <laughs> we're, not, we're not comfortable with being still. Yet we want to hear the voice of God. And over and over again in Scripture, one of the things that you discover is that it seems to be that God's favorite way to speak to us is in moments of stillness. There's this guy named Elijah. He's not your average choir boy. He called fire down from heaven, brought national revival. He needed to hear the voice of God. So he goes up on a mountain, he's in a cave, and the Bible says there's a fire. Big fire, blazing fire, rowdy fire. Couldn't hear God in it. Then there's a wind, a big wind, a hurricane-like wind. He couldn't hear God in it. So then stuff started shaking. The earth literally began to shake under his feet. It was an earthquake. 
but he couldn't hear God in it. And the Bible says the moment when then Elijah finally heard God is when there came a still, small voice that heaven chose to speak in a whisper and Elijah couldn't hear it until everything got still. And we want God to bring something big and something loud and something that captures our attention. And then we think that we will hear his voice. But the truth of it is he chooses to speak in the moments of stillness. The question is whether or not we will create them so that we can hear him. Still. How many times have we missed the voice of God, the direction of God, the destiny of God, the purpose of God, but for no other reason than the fact that we could not deal with the concept of being still. See, we want God to turn his voice up, but if you're going to hear God, you're going to have to be still, and that means you're going to have to turn everything else down. That is how you be still. Sometimes it means you got to lay the phone to the side. Sometimes it means you got to stop binging on Netflix. It means sometimes you ride down the road without the radio turned on. It means sometimes your phone actually goes on silent and do not disturb. Sometimes you just got to have a place where you turn everything else down. And even when you're reading his word, it begins to leap off the pages because you're just being still. Just look at somebody and tell them, be still. There's another man in scripture, his name is Moses. He did incredible things for God. We've already referenced some of what happened in his life today. But there's another moment, a moment when he's first getting his calling. He's on the backside of a wilderness. He's went through some difficult time. He's possibly going to be charged as a criminal. And he's wrestling his way through all of that. But, But he happens to see that there's this bush. It doesn't appear to be a big bush from what scripture implies. it. It's, it's some shrubbery and it, it happens to be on fire and, and he, he stops and, and he looks at it and he's just standing still and he's trying to make sense of it and he senses that God is speaking to him and God says, if you want to hear what else I've got to say, you're going to have to take your sandals off. And that, that's, that's got a lot of prophetic unction. There's a lot of revelation within why he took his shoes off. But what if at the end of the day, it just simply meant be still. Like, like what if to be still, we're going to have to make the decision to stop moving? Like, like what if we really want to hear the voice of God, that we're going to have to make the decision to take off our shoes and stay a while? Everybody wants to talk about Acts chapter 2 especially people who have a spirit-empowered background. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Hallelujah, praise God. Cloven tongues of fire sat on each one of them. Peter got up and preached to 3,000 people. Ten minutes, they all got saved. My goodness, that's church. Anybody say amen? amen? But what we missed is they had to sit there for 10 days. 10 days in a room being still. And then came the suddenly. We don't do what they did because we won't do what they did. We don't know how to stop moving. We give God an hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday. And that's a struggle for us. Because the whole time we're engaged in the moment, we're thinking about where we got to get to next and the appointments we've got to check off and these things we got to get the kids to and these things we got to wrap up before Monday comes. And... We just struggle to be still. But if you're going to be still, you're going to have to turn everything down and you're going to have to stop moving. But I'm also going to say to you, you're going to have to choose a time. Because the time will never choose you. That's what God told Adam and Eve. He said, I'm going to give you a whole week. You get a whole week, you get seven days. But you're going to choose a day to be still. You're not going to work. You're not going to be engaged in anything but my presence and hearing my voice. And the first day that man was alive, they were created on the sixth day. 
was God's seventh day. So the first day that man was alive, he's just being still and he's looking at everything that God made and he's saying, it is good, 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 it is very good. Some of us don't even realize the good things we've got in our life because we never are still enough to just look around and say, man, God's been good. Oh man, God's been good. Oh, he was good on Monday. He was good on Tuesday. He was good on Wednesday. He was good on Thursday. He's good on Friday. He's still good on Saturday. Then I'm here to tell you he really good come Sunday. I don't know who I'm trying to help this morning, but somebody's got to get the word that every once in a while you just got to be still. The Sabbath was not a suggestion. It was a command. And it may be the greatest sin in modern Christianity that there is no stillness. No ability to just say, this period of time is reserved. For his voice. Come on, tell somebody, be still. But you can't just, you can't just make the decision, you're gonna turn everything down, you're gonna stop moving, you're gonna choose the time. A chosen time requires a chosen place. You have to select a place. Jesus, he's talking to the disciples. He said, you want to know how to pray? Here's how you pray. He finds you a private place. And you shut the door. What was he saying? No hindrances. No distractions. No public audience. He said, if you really want to engage me in prayer... Just be still. And he even said, away with the nonsensical, vain repetitions that make you feel good about your prayer life. He said, be totally okay saying what needs to be said and be still. Probably the most praying young man I ever met, I met about 20 years ago. I don't know that I've ever met a young man that prayed like he prayed. He'd get up praying and he'd go to bed praying. Every time you've seen him, he's inviting you to another prayer meeting. And had as, had as little wisdom as anyone I've ever met in ministry. And I was baffled by it. How can you pray that much and never have a lick of sense when it comes to making the right decisions? And I asked the Lord about it. This is what I believe the Lord said to me. Eric, the problem is he does all the talking. You say what needs to be said. And then you listen. And you let his word talk to you. Get you a place. This is the last thing I'll say to you about being still. You're getting it right? If we're going to be still, we got to turn everything down. Got to stop moving. Got to choose a time. Got to select a place. But if you really want a meaningful connection with God, you're going to have to silence your storm. Here's what I mean by that. We all want God to silence the storm on the outside. And none of us want to acknowledge the storm that's on the inside. When you read scripture, it seems to me very hard to find a place where that God ever says that he's going to guard your mind for you. He talks about he will guard your heart, but he puts a responsibility on us to be disciplined in what comes into our mind and the storm that is associated with our mind. And I want to show you something that Scripture says. It's Psalm chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. God goes on to tell those people in Psalm 4 everything He's going to do for them on the outside. But the first thing he required them to do was acknowledge there was something going on inside of them that wasn't right. 
Something inside that had to be calmed. Something inside that had to be stilled. And, and it's a lesson to all of us that, that if we're going to really have a meaningful connection with God and a meaningful connection with others, we, we can't operate out of whatever it is that flared up the last moment inside of us. That's why you should never discipline your kids when you're angry. Get yourself somewhere and get yourself calmed down. Steal the storm and then bring the discipline. And many times if you'll let God settle what's happening on the inside, you'll discover that he can speak to what's happening on the outside. And there is absolutely no storm that's ever crawled out of hell that he can't decree and declare. Peace, be still. But what if one of the prerequisites for hearing peace, be still on the outside is directly connected to the willingness to tell yourself on the inside, stand still. We struggle with it. We don't like the thought of it. But when Jesus talked to those disciples, after he calmed on the outside, he started talking to them about the issue that was on the inside. He's like, y'all are worried about what's going on on the outside. You got something bigger going on on the inside. You're dealing with doubt. You're dealing with fear. You're dealing with all these things of the world. And I came to tell you, you can have peace on the inside and it'll cause you to never even have to worry or fret about what's going on on the outside. So, so why don't you get my word alive on the inside and then watch what it'll do on the outside. I dare you to just tell somebody, be still. Be still. Be still. I, I'm gonna leave you this morning with one final thought as they begin to just play the music softly. There's, a, there's this passage. Uh, I didn't share it in the other service. I'm not even sure if I should share it now because it, it doesn't allow me to like package this message together kind of cute and neat at the end. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I saw something in scripture. And I saw it this morning about five o'clock. No, well, that's not right. It's about one o'clock. It's about one o'clock in the morning I saw this. It's just a passage. Luke chapter 7, verse 12. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out. And the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said, Do not weep. And then he came and he touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still. And Jesus said, young man, I say to you, arise. If I could speak to you in a metaphorical, figurative, prophetic tone, there are those of you that are packing something that's dead. In fact, it's so dead, you've thought, going to have to bury that dream. Going to have to bury that vision. Probably going to have to bury that calling. It's dead. And you're in the procession towards that dream being buried forever. And I just felt like, if, if I could say with prophetic unction, I really believe this morning that God would say to you, if you'll just stand still. If you'll just stand still. If you'll, if you'll just turn everything down. If you'll stop moving. If you'll choose a time and you'll select a place and you'll silence all the anger and grief that's inside of you. God's about to speak to some dead stuff and it's going to come alive again in such a way that coincidence will never be able to take the credit for it and God himself will get all the glory if you'll just stand still. Do you know that God showed up and talked to Abraham and said, I'm going to destroy a city and your family's going to die with it? And the Bible says that everybody that surrounded Abraham, when he heard this, they walked off, but the Bible says Abraham stood still and started pleading with God and said, God, let my family live. God, let my family live. 
God, and Abraham's family was saved because when everybody else was moving and running around, he stood still. You better learn the moments to stand still. It's going to impact every facet and every aspect of your life, and it's going to take your meaningful connections with God to the next level. Can I get a witness and an amen from somebody under the sound of my voice this morning? Come on, give him praise for the fact he brings dead things back to life again. Give him praise for the fact that he's the one who can save families when everybody's written them off and said it'll never happen. Give him praise for the fact that he can part the Red Seas, take the wheels off the enemy and the things that he's chasing you with, give him praise that sometimes you don't even have to fight your own battle simply because you stand still and you see the Lord. I'm going to leave you with one final verse this morning. And it's in the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms makes this statement in chapter 46, verse 10. Last thing I'm going to say to you, be still and know that I am God. The reason some of us don't know he's God is because we won't be still long enough for him to show us. My God, I feel the, I just about could have a fit this morning. My goodness. Do you, does it make sense to you? Like some of, we just don't know he's God because we just won't be still and let him show us. So there's a time to go forward and position yourself, but there's also a time to be still. And if you're, running from, if you're running from the enemy, it's about time for you just to stop right where you're at and let the enemy know you're not running me anywhere else. I'm not going to run from this relationship to that relationship and from this job to that job and from this thing to that thing. I'm going to stand still right here and watch my God be God and his enemies be scattered because if he be for me, who or what can be against me? God, I'm going to make room for you to move. I'm going to make room for you to move. I'm going to make room for you to move.